My name is Guillermina Zavala. I'm the director of the Media Arts Program at CEC in San Antonio, Texas, the ancestral land known as Yanawana. I attended this year's Teaching Artists Guild conference, Our Share Future. Many voices and many stories resonated with me from the sessions I heard. This audio piece focuses on two main aspects of the conference, community and social justice curriculum. You'll hear excerpts from two sessions, Teaching Artists Stories and Making Meaning with Dr. Jamaica Osorio. Both panels were moderated by Miko Lee, who is a member of the National Advisory Committee of the Teaching Artists Guild. The intro music was performed by Laura Rios Ramirez and her son, and is part of one of my students' projects in which he explored his indigenous roots. This podcast centers on the idea of exploring cultural identities through creative experiences. As a Latinx educator and artist, I often struggle with finding my own voice within the Latinx community, which is extremely diverse and encompasses many stories. Nicole opens up the first session by sharing a personal story. Hello, you all. I feel like I'm telling a bunch of origin stories, but I just wanted to share this one because one, these are some of my favorite artist people. They're going to introduce themselves because I couldn't do justice to saying how brilliant they are. But I just want to say that each of these people, um, we have had independent individual conversations during the course of the pandemic about stories and our stories as teaching artists and, and how important they are and why is it important for us to share who we are with the students that we have in the community. Um, and one of the things that I shared with some of them was when my uh, when one of my daughters was in middle school, she went to, um, uh, was on a full scholarship at a private all girls school. In seventh grade, they were studying uh, feudal Japan. As many of you know, that's part of the curriculum. And the teacher came into the classroom. This was a school that was focused on multiple intelligence theory, focused on art space work. And the teacher came into the classroom dressed in a kimono. She was a white woman. She came in dressed in a kimono and had a bald um, like sumo wrestler cap that was on her head um, and addressed the class with an accent. And my daughter came home and shared this story with me, and we were quite disturbed by this, especially I have a background teaching traditional classical Japanese dance. And this is a school that really encourages parents to be involved, but nobody reached out to me, nobody asked. Um, and so this brought up a really powerful conversation at that school when I said, hmm, what's the story here? How did this happen? And that teacher said, we really wanted to engage the students. That was important to us. I would love each of the brilliant panelists to um, introduce themselves. I'm going to call on you and just say your name, your region, where you're from, and a little bit about your art form. I'm Amalia Ortiz. I'm living in San Antonio, Texas. I work for an organization called SACI, which is a year-round after-school arts organization. Um, my primary focus is theater, spoken word, uh, creative writing <clears throat> and honoring youth voice, which is the main mission of our organization. I feel very much like a facilitator of youth art, uh, lots of conversations with the youth and what they wanna create and then helping them to create those projects. Well, my name is Tamar Anderson. Um, I am a, a performing artist uh, out of Philadelphia, PA, uh, perform a lot, I should say, along the Eastern seaboard and across a lot of different areas. Um, I am also uh, the curator of uh, the BIPOC database and resource guide. Uh, I also have a production company called Gumbo Lab, which is a virtual platform, theatrical platform for Black females trans women, femme solo artists, and I'm also one of the founding um, members of Black Lives Matter at School Steering Committee, uh, where it's a national organization that um, has been around since 2017. I'm Brittany Boyd Bullock from Memphis, Tennessee. 
I'm a visual artist uh, and program director for the Memphis Music Initiative. Um, I, you know, my work is steeped in how do we maintain and create right relationships with young people from an anti-adultist model and framework. Um, as an artist, I uh, work with fiber and I'm a mixed media artist uh, and I use color, story and repetition um, as representation of my lineage and um, inciting joy and wonder, right? So happy to be here. I am Eddie Madrill. I'm from the Pascua Yaqui people. The Yaqui people are from the Sonora Desert region of the United States, Mexico area. Um, but uh, I, uh, I'm here over in the Bay Area and uh, my art form, I guess, if that's what you want to call it, is a, the, the tradition of doing American Indian dance. Um, and with that, as an artist, you know, as we grow in our, in our age and our identity, um, introducing more of my tribal specific background and foundation into what I do. Um, but I think it's kind of like any art form where you learn rules and you learn the foundation of those rules and then you find ways to go ahead and introduce those things. How do you teach something if you are not of the culture, right? And so that's the kind of conversation to open up today. Who tells whose story? Uh, that's such a, um, a complicated question for me and one that I've held for quite some time as an artist. And, um, you know, a, a friend and a beloved once told me that, um, you know, folks will extract your story, issue it back to you and leave you out of it. And I, uh, in thinking about that, I often carry with me and think through like the notion of story and for me, story is, um, it's spiritual, right? There's, there's an ancestral uh, memory and story that I carry often. And so if I think about it in that way, uh, to then try to provide an answer of who gets to tell story and, and whose story do folks get to tell, my response would be, well, when you decide to lift and share story, are you in right relationship to that story? Are you in right relationship to the people in the story? Are you in a right relationship to the land, uh, to the setting of that story? Are you in right relationship to the objects and the way of being and the culture? And if you're not, then no, you don't get to tell it. Um, and I, I also believe that if you decide to, to, to tell and share seeds of story, um, be mindful that you are harvesting seeds and planting them in different soil. Who's able to tell the story? I think, um, you know, if you watch the news, you have the interview with the person who was actually in the situation and you ask them like firsthand kind of empirical evidence of what took place and you have the bystander and that's not exactly the same thing. So for somebody to tell my story, kind of taking a risk and taking a chance at being able to cover um, what's authentic. So who's allowed? I don't know. It's, that's a really, that's a really tough question because there's, you know, American Indian people who might be on a reservation that know nothing about their culture. They're living it. Therefore, they don't need to practice it or learn it. And there's people who are in urban areas who are Native American who know everything about their culture, except for experiencing it because they're not on the reservation. Without any local prehistoric reference, we must assume that our creator created Mother Earth and Father Sky. Our youth organization is a um, year-round after-school arts organization, and all my, my theater students are writing their own plays. And so um, it is beginning with the stories that they want to tell, um, honoring like the language that they want to tell it in. We have had stories before that have been bilingual, but also bringing in teaching artists of different cultural backgrounds. Um, I I'm thinking of another example of where our, our students created a show called Napaco, which was um, uh, a retelling of a local, the, the history of the river, uh, the San Antonio River as told on the white shaman panel. And so we worked with like a, a, white, a white shaman panel expert who came in and did lectures on the panel 
and uh, learning about the, the mythology of not only that cave painting, but the local river and geography. In the time of the cold, the dark, the deep, and the wet, Mother Earth removed her head from her body and created the moon. And the moon began to rise above the horizon and cast its mere image over the waters. And its twin, the winter sun, became. That was an excerpt from Napaco, a multimedia performance by the Ceci Teatro Alas group. It's looking outside of my own knowledge for my students, uh, challenging my students to look outside of their own knowledge, their own cultural heritage at time, times, but also bringing, bringing what their own cultural heritage to the table um, when we are deciding what are the stories we're gonna tell, um, when we are gonna have creative writing exercises, just honoring every, you know, all of their diverse stories. Thank you for that. Uh, Tamara, who can tell whose story? It's such a powerful question because, so as somebody, I feel like I'm constantly on the thread of this with adult artists and also working with teaching artists in schools and working with teachers in schools, right? So that's where my life intersects, right? So I train K through 12 educators and one of the places where I feel like I'm always the intervention is when I bring up culturally relevant pedagogy. So it's not, so the school itself, like I feel like the school, the schools as an institution and art organizations as an institution are, are solely focused on a white gaze. How funding comes through, how they view you as an artist, how they, how they even sell what you're going to do to kids, for kids. And I say two kids because I feel like it's done two kids. That was, that was an accident when I said that. Um, but I also feel like right now we're in a space where people are trying to check off boxes. And I'm very concerned about the checking off of boxes because then that means that you're not investing holistically in the adults in the space, truly understanding what it means to give over and hand over and understand culturally relevant pedagogy or culturally relevant teaching or identity. What does that mean in the classroom? It also means we're not building these radical relationships in the classroom and amongst each other to really get to know where our kids are with the community that surrounds them. So that it can, uh, we can, we not only can get away the gaze, but we can also kind of circumvent what the funders want sometimes, right? Um, and still get the money in places where it pays for amazing things to happen, right? Like I'm always concerned when DEI resources are mentioned and they don't mention race or gender or white supremacy. They're just like, we're just gonna talk about this. And so if you're not talking about those things, then you're also not talking, challenging who should tell the story. At a different session with Dr. Jamaica Osorio, who is an assistant professor of Indigenous and Native Hawaiian politics at the University of Hawaii and a three-time national poetry champion, moderator Miko Lee poses the same question regarding cultural identities. Who tells whose story and who is it okay for, who is it not? How do we navigate that? That's a great question. Um, and I think, you know, the, the historical context is really important here, right? So in Hawaii, up until almost, almost the 90s, um, nearly everything written and published in an academic arena about Hawaii was done by foreigners. Um, and not only was it done by foreign haole, white men in particular, it was done by white men who refused to learn the language and actually read sources in Hawaiian. So they were reproducing their own assumptions about Hawaii. They were reproducing generations of foreign uh, Western assumptions about, about Hawaii's history. And that became this self-replicating canon. Um, that has been since disrupted by um, a few generations of very powerful troublemaking um, Hawaiian activists and scholars. Um, but it leads to this really 
really important moment in understanding who has the authority, the kule, and now we might say the, the authority, the responsibility, and the privilege to tell our stories and how to do that in a meaningful way. For me, the like anything else, as an educator, it, it is my job to expose my students to different stories, different histories, different ideas, and different perspectives, but it is not my job to speak for those ideas, stories, and perspectives. And the hope is that we cultivate a classroom where students feel really safe to step forward and say, um, Kumu, teacher, professor, um, this doesn't really land well with me. Can I share why, you know, what we're talking about or how we're talking about something makes me uncomfortable? And to me, that that's the center of what it means to be, um, uh, you know, that's when I feel like I've actually succeeded when students correct me, when students push back. Um, and it's, it's what happens after that I think will define us as educators, how we respond. How do you decolonize your teaching artistry, your practice as an educator? In Hawaii, the word to teach is the same word to learn, a'o. Um, there is no way to use the word without it being reciprocal, meaning you cannot teach without learning and you cannot learn without teaching. And so as a Hawaiian educator, I know when I, when I step into any classroom, whether that's like a traditional classroom or I don't know, we're out in some field telling stories or we're at the foot of a mountain trying to block desecration, um, I need to step into that space with the humility to understand that I'm coming to learn. The discipline of Mo'olelo teaches us that there is room for multiple truths. And in fact, multiple truths make us powerful. And many of our students have been educated, you know, many of my young undergraduate students have been educated to think of history as a single line, as a single story. Um, and anything outside of that story causes conflict, um, causes tension in a way that isn't productive for them. And so we do a lot of unlearning of that in my classroom to make room for all of the stories that come with them and all of the stories that I'm bringing into that space and understanding that we don't actually always have to reconcile these things, that two differing things can actually be true at the same time. Um, and again, that, that can come to be a little more uncomfortable in the time that we're living in where um, there is a lot of misinformation being fed to, to everyone around us. And so making that distinction between misinformation and like the truth that our students walk into the classroom with um, and how to cultivate that truth, those truths um, so that they can continue to be open to learning and they can continue to be open to teaching those of us who are around them, including their, um, their teachers. This poem was written as a way to honor what it means to stand in the sacred. And I wanted to share it with you folks today because to me, it, it speaks to the way that we can have cross-cultural um, conversations rooted, not in a sense of flattening difference, but actually rooted in our own understandings of the sacred and respect. And um, so I'd, I'd like to share it with you folks today. It's called um, Call to Prayer. If I have faith, it is only because I know what it means to stand at the foot of a mountain, my whole body a prayer, the whole island a monument, and to see the center shining through the mist. I still see her before me, even from hundreds of miles away, anytime I have the strength to look to the horizon. If I have courage, it is only because I have watched our story remake itself in my generation. I have seen an island born from pole from a whisper in the quietest parts of ourselves here, a promise that we refuse to forget or forsake that this place is ours, only so much as this place is us. And I've held it in my hands, the birthing of worlds, pole turned light, turned pukoa, turned slime, turned gods in a time of mere men. I have watched the call of the intrepid summon Manaya Kalani every morning in the hands of our kuana, Maui, fishing us one by one from the dark sea of this forgetting. If I have devotion, 
It is only because I have traveled into the bosom of our gods. I have crossed the people from Wakea to Wakea and sailed upon the dark and shining road of Kane deep into the realm of our ancestors. And I have returned with the knowledge that to lay in the puli of our kupuna is to commit yourself to the prayer of memory, to cast your eyes upon Kue Hailani and to pull her shimmering body from the skin of the sea. If I have anger, it is only because I know the stories of our loss. Ki'i burnt to ash, stones and ko'a removed, now the foundations of billionaire estates. I am aware that nearly everywhere we walk, we are trampling upon the bones of my ancestors. I know the mo'olelo of the hundreds of thousands dead and dying. I have seen the signs of the separating sicknesses born again like Haumea in every Hawaiian generation. I know the names of the thieves the crooks in finely sewn suits praying to their capital as they pillage and loot our holy cities, leaving us with nothing but a whisper of what we once believed. And yet I still have aloha, but only because I am still here with all my kupuna beside me. And when I stand in your shadow, you tower over me like a recollection, like a mountain, with so many stories I will never know, in languages I will never speak, thousands of miles away from your home, and the aina and alchemy that made you, the hands that formed you like an island consecrated. You are here, pointed even in the wrong direction, a desecration, and still, your kaumaha is not foreign to me. You feel more family than stranger, and in your magnificent shadow, I hear our calls to prayer. This was a collection of sound bites from our Share Future, the 2022 Teaching Artist Skills Conference. I'm Guillermina Zabala, Media Arts Director and Teaching Artist at Stacey. Special thanks to the conference organizers, the panelists, and all the amazing teaching artists who attended the conference.